been my great pleasure to commence today's Václav Havel European Dialogues Conference, the unique event initiated by the Václav Havel Library, which currently travels along the network of the Czech centers as the fruit of this year's Czech presidency in the European Union Council. We are excited to offer the most compelling of talks today, so I will keep my introduction really short. I am extremely pleased that the group of speakers uh, in front of me has agreed to participate uh, in our conference. We approached experts uh, who we suspected to avoid speaking with a prior rigid reverence about Havel's school of thought. Uh, unfortunately so, two of the invited uh, female experts are unable to attend today for personal reasons. Uh, nevertheless, those debating today are experts who have been writing, pondering, reflecting on Václav Havel or his days continuously. Uh, above all, they represent the larger community of people who, while staying in touch with the younger generations, simply relate to the continuity of thought and new social contexts of uh, Havel's work. The chosen thematic framework of the conference corresponds with the ways of our endeavor in speaking to the younger generation. Uh, I myself clearly remember the moment uh, when I left my apartment in the morning with the so-called Občanské Forum, the, the Civic Forum badge on my label, although it must be added that I was heading to the third grade uh, in the elementary school and the rally decoration was pinned onto me by my parents. Uh, today, I mainly recall some of the first heated social debates, the first political and also tabloid scandals of the until then untouchable figure of Václav Havel, and finally the unprecedented and truly spontaneous and self-organized commemoration on Wenceslas Square on the 18th of December 2011, uh, the day of Havel's passing. These memories probably place me somewhere between a boomer and a millennial. Uh, in any case, I observed with curiosity, for example, the annual commemorations and protests held in the Czech Republic on the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. After all, November uh, the 17th fittingly missed our conference by only a few days. And I wonder how much of Havel both symbolic and practical, still lingers in society. Apart from the pioneer heart emoji and hipster pants, do his texts uh, thrive in relevancy as they did in 1989? Hopefully, today, you will find yourself uh, closer on the path to answer to that question. Thank you for your attention. Have a submersive fun. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Laszlo Brus, the co-director of the, the Democracy Institute at the Central European University. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Laszlo Brus. I'm a co-director of the Democracy Institute. Uh, I'm uh, one of these boomers. Uh, uh, who uh, still can say that I saw Václav Havel. Václav uh, uh, Havel, I saw him in November 89. Uh, uh, I was on the Wenceslas Square. Uh, uh, I was not alone. Uh, there were another two, three hundred thousand people on the square. Actually, my legs didn't even touch the surface because I was held by the crowd. There were so many people there. Uh, and Havel was uh, talking uh, uh, from a balcony. Uh, in one of these places, uh, uh, and uh, uh, actually that was uh, a very interesting uh, exercise uh, in uh, referendum. It's a prototype version of referendum where uh, he was uh, reading the different parts uh, of uh, the agreement that they were going to sign uh, with the communists, uh, uh, and read one by one the lines, and then uh, the crowd, starting from the Museum of History, started, no, and then went over the square. And then uh, uh, for other one, yes, from the other part of uh, Wenceslas Square. So it was very uh, interesting when 300 people uh, participated in direct uh, referendums. And then next day, they uh, executed these uh, the outcomes. So today we are uh, having a wonderful event to talk about the I try not to mispronounce. Most best, best, most me. Yes. I mean, 
And uh, the power of powerless that, that I read first in Samizdat, still in the early 80s. And then I took a course uh, at the European University Institute in 87 from Stephen uh, Lux. Uh, uh, for him, it was mandatory reading uh, uh, about the series of power, and that's how we read. And I will not uh, uh, talk to uh, you about uh, uh, the base, how he describes uh, uh, why dissent is important, how uh, dissent uh, uh, plays a role. Uh, just one uh, uh, personal uh, thing that he plays with this question, uh, uh, which he doesn't answer, of course, he cannot answer, uh, this question of, of uh, uh, wherefore dissent. Uh, how can you see the effects? And, and, uh, uh, and he's very, very clear about that. Uh, 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 there's no way to see uh, uh, when and how uh, dissent might uh, yield uh, something, uh, how it is important. But the slogan is, uh, he still doesn't know the slogan of Nike, which is just do it. Uh, but uh, something like that has comes through from the text. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then I can answer. Uh, uh, the question of, of Havas. He asked explicitly the question uh, why, why this sense is uh, 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 not, actually not why, that will be the topic of the panelists. Uh, the, the question that he asked is, uh, uh, and he doesn't answer, what will be the effect? What will be the effect? He cannot answer that. And it is uh, clear about that. It's, you cannot uh, uh, see that uh, in advance. But what uh, uh, we did in uh, Roughly 10, 12 years after the regime change, uh, we did a survey, we did a, a data collection, uh, uh, looked at uh, how dissent is linked uh, to uh, political change uh, and this is linked to economic change. Uh, uh, we uh, used the archives of the Radio Free Europe, uh, that is actually here uh, a few blocks away from uh, the uh, DI, uh, the Democracy Institute, that's in the Open Society Archive. And uh, doctoral students coded all the uh, uh, dissident events from uh, uh, organizing an illegal gathering uh, in a uh, home to publishing a petition or organizing a demonstration. And we did that in all the countries, all the post communist countries, so from Kyrgyzstan to Poland. And uh, what we found uh, can be summarized basically in one sentence. That's, uh, Actually, uh, Barrington Moore takes uh, from also Marx uh, 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 when he says that uh, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. But uh, uh, what we found was not that. What we found was no dissent, no democracy. Uh, that what we found was that uh, 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 in the last five years of communist regimes, uh, those countries uh, uh, that didn't have dissent, didn't have activities, any kind of events, uh, 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 they basically, for them, the transition was from one type of authoritarian rule to another type of authoritarian rule. All of them. All of them. That's uh, 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 no uh, difference. And uh, uh, countries uh, that had, uh, even uh, 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 in uh, uh, discussing discussion clubs, illegal discussion clubs, uh, uh, harassed by uh, the authorities, that uh, uh, day number uh, was uh, uh, in a strong and significant relationship uh, to having democracy 10 years later and having economic reforms actually uh, uh, 10 years later. So uh, uh, this uh, matters and most probably uh, the link is very simple uh, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, trains uh, an alternative elite, it trains people who know what to do when opportunities arise uh, 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 to make change, make difference. Uh, and uh, with these short ideas, uh, I would like to thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you will have uh, wonderful uh, discussions and give the floor to the panelists, I think, to Peter, Peter Kraster. Thank you. <clears throat>
principle of calling this the alphabetical order of their names. Uh, so, in this uh, line first, uh, I would like to invite Pavel Basha to join the He's a political scientist and philosopher. Uh, he's uh, currently a professor of political science at the faculty, if I'm like right, yeah, okay. Just correct me if I have outdated information. So, uh, the, uh, Faculty of Arts and Philosophy at Charles University and was a long term research fellow at the Institute of International Relations in Prague. He has published both scholarly and popular books and essays, uh, essays on, uh, on different, different topics. So, uh, and what you should know about him, that we were neighbors at the CU when we both were professors here, our offices were just next door. So it's, uh, we have been knowing each other for quite a long time. Uh, yeah, that's a boomer with a telephone. <laughs> okay. Um, our next participant is uh, Uriel Plev. Please. Please. Social political historian and post communist and post communist, uh, post communist Central Europe, in particular of Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic, uh, with specialization in oral history and everyday life history. She graduated in Paris with a research thesis on Václav Havel's uh, ethics and politics and defended her PhD in history. She was advisor to the director of research and methodology at the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes, which was between 2014 and 18. Uh, in the meantime, she is an Ellis Richter Fellow in University of Graz, Department of Sociology, since she has been fired from her previous position in Prague. In this very institute. Okay, um, our next panelist is Andrea Bozoki, who is professor at the Department of Political Science. Uh, his main fields of research include democratization, deep democratization, which is our topic today, partly, uh, political regimes, ideologies, central European politics and the role of intellectuals. He's also a research affiliate at the CU Democracy Institute. As we all know, we are guests of this, this institution. Uh, he's also, uh, yeah, uh, he was visiting professor at several universities in the US and Europe and has published nine academic volumes in English. I'm not sure if he knows how, by heart, exactly how many in Hungarian. I mean, I'm, not sure that. I mean, once I saw them, it was like a, quite a, a long bookshelf. So, um, his political activities, uh, <coughs> he in uh, 1989, Andrzej Bozoki participated at the National Roundtable negotiations. So, he was an active participant in change of the system. and. Uh, Later on, in 2005 and 6, he was a Minister of Culture of Hungary. No? Okay. So, our next uh, we see Michal Czerny. I would like to invite him to the panel. He's currently Head of Science and Research Unit at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Czech Republic but he is practically native in Budapest. Uh, I'm actually very glad that uh, Hungarians, in the good sense of this word, have a permanent representation in the, in the Czech, partly, uh, in, the, in the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it's, uh, I'm kind of proud, proud to say this. That, uh, so he's, he's uh, related to Hungary in hundreds of ways. Um, and uh, as he was, he was director of the Czech Center here in Budapest. Uh, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, right after the changes, 
and uh, made a diplomatic career there. Before uh, that, he was a freelance intellectual uh, and translator. Uh, yes. And finally, but it is only due to the, to the ABC, uh, Martin Palos. I would like to invite Mr. Palos to the panel. one of the first signers of Chapter 77 and founder of the Civic Forum um, in about which we, we heard from Adela in uh, 1989. His first doctoral degree is in chemistry and the last one is international law. Uh, to my best knowledge, the, 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 last, the, the last latest one, I'm not sure what happened uh, after this. So he, between 2006 and 11, he served as permanent representative to the United Nations for the Czech Republic. He also lectures at several universities all over the world. Between uh, 2011 and 2012, he was the director of Václav Havel Library, and since uh, 2018, is member of the board of directors of the Institute for Research of Totalitarian Regimes in Prague. Uh, and me, finally, and briefly, uh, and Peter Krastev, uh, former CEU uh, lecturer, now social scientist, teaching at a university called Budapest Business School, communication department, and my focus my academic interest is Central and Eastern Europe, Social Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. So that's how I became, I was invited to moderate this panel and it is my pleasure to, to have you all here. Um, okay, and I have to confess that, oh yes, now uh, about, about 45 minutes, after my 45 minutes presentation you will... <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Of course not. But uh, I have to confess that it was my, my idea to, to, to give this uh, quite bizarre, bizarre title to, to our meeting today. Um, how, how it happened, just in, in, a, in a nutshell to explain it, uh, as, uh, as Laszlo mentioned that we all read, I mean, we all had the chance to read the, this, 